Hello, my name is Mr. Tom Froze, and these are my thoughts on illustration. This is a bi-weekly podcast about showing up and growing up as an illustrator. Welcome to episode three. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about what you need to learn first on your way to becoming an illustrator. This is part two of two, so if you haven't listened to part one, please go listen to that first in episode three. In the first part, we covered two different kinds of drawing and the traditional media types besides drawing, which are painting, mixed media, and printmaking. Today, we're going to look at some more specialized areas of study, such as color theory and graphic design. The last thing on this list might surprise you, but I think it's actually one of the most important skills to learn. Stick around all the way to the end to find out what it is. If you like what you hear in today's episode, you can support me by following me and rating and reviewing this podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. You can also support me on Patreon, where you can get exclusive access to my live monthly drawing meetups called Draw With Me, plus all the past meetups as replays. Join today at patreon.com slash tomfroze. Now, before we get on to the rest of the list, I promised I'd tell you the story of how I became an illustrator and how that sort of came together through a combination of self-learning and more formal art school education as a designer. So if you listen to episodes one and two, you'll know that I was in computer engineering when I discovered that something called graphic design was being taught at my school. And from that point forward, I was obsessed and dead set on doing that. During the three years of my computer engineering education, I started to do a lot of drawing in my sketchbook, really mostly just drawing from life, drawing myself in the mirror, drawing from my imagination, and things like that. Pretty directionless, but still meaningful. I was getting better through practice. I was also interested in learning web design, so I was developing skills in HTML and CSS to build websites just for fun. Being in computer engineering, of course, I was picking up a few programming skills. I was also working part-time for a company that made security cameras for taxis, which is a whole other story, but they often had me create brochures for them using desktop publishing software called Corel Draw, and that was very similar to Adobe Illustrator. So I was picking up skills in design and I was learning illustration tools as well and also getting to try my hand at real world design projects. Nobody was training me on these things. I was learning as I went along. Now let's fast forward to graduation from Humber College where at this point I had my diploma in computer engineering technology. I remember having a talk with my boss, the owner of this taxi camera company, And he was just starting out this new trampoline company on the side with a New Zealand-based inventor who had designed a springless trampoline. Today, you'll know this company as Spring Free Trampoline. My boss at the time, Steve Holmes, built up that company from zero to what is now the leading trampoline brand. And I was there at the very beginning. Steve knew that I was passionate about design and, of course, he knew I was already doing design work for his taxi camera company. So he offered me a full-time job as the in-house designer for Spring Free Trampoline. So think about that for a second. I had just spent three years of my life studying a totally different subject, which I pretty much hated, but for some reason I knew I had to stick with. And then having wanted to switch to design from the very beginning, I end up getting a job as a designer anyway. That's what I would call a pretty big break. And Steve, if you're listening, I owe you so much for pretty much kickstarting the creative career I'm enjoying today. I had no real qualifications as a designer, but suddenly I was responsible to carry the brand of this new product as it was ambitiously aiming to carve out its place in the market. The big push at the time was to get the trampolines into Costco, so I had a lot of work on the design side to get the packaging and manuals and even the safety labels on the trampoline itself up to standard. Eventually, I'd help redesign the company brand, which is still in use today, and 
I would also art direct their first international e-commerce website, along many other things. Before I was art school trained as a designer, I was very much self-taught, and most of this was literally by learning on the job. You'd better believe I was poring over design books and magazines, taking part-time design classes, and scouring the web for whatever I was hungry to learn at the time. Now, although this was a huge opportunity for me, I never quite felt comfortable in the position because I never felt like I took the right way to get there. It felt all just too easy. I always felt like an imposter. When people asked me what I did for a living, when I said I was a designer, I always said it with a shameful feeling that I was lying because I never went to school for it. Now, obviously, I had a bit of a self-esteem problem. Here I was being paid a salary to be a designer for a pretty cool company, and I couldn't call myself a designer. Well, to my credit, I think there was some truth to my feeling. I really struggled to feel confident about what I was doing, about the decisions I was making, like in my design work, and about whether of, at, like w was any of the work I was doing even any good. I never really felt like I knew what I was doing, and that's because I never had the opportunity to learn from others more experienced than me who could guide me through the early days of being a designer. I had no design mentors. I also felt a bit isolated, that designers who learned in the classroom had more of a connection to other designers. There was a sort of inside that I was outside of. Right or wrong, I really did feel like an outsider, and I wanted to change that. So I started to look at what design programs were being offered and what might be needed to get into them. I looked into both community colleges and universities, but I ultimately decided that I wanted a degree. The long story short is that I discovered there was a reputable design program at a scrappy little art school in Halifax, Nova Scotia, called NASCAD or NSCAD, and for various reasons, I locked into that one specifically, and I, de I decided to go all in. I would apply to NASCAD, and if I got in, then I would quit my job and go to this school. And if I didn't, if I didn't get it accepted, I would just keep working at Spring Free and figure things out from there. Having made this decision, I read up on the admissions requirements to get into the foundation year and I got to work. When applying to art school alongside academic requirements, you also have to put together an entrance portfolio. I didn't have an entrance portfolio yet, and so this is what I had to get to work to. Now, as an aside, if you're wondering what you should include in your first student portfolio, I recommend that you find a degree program and read up on their specific portfolio requirements. A portfolio for getting into art school is going to be very different from a portfolio of someone who's trying to get a job as a designer or illustrator. But if you're just starting out from zero, you probably should be thinking more like the pre-admission student. This is how you lay down your foundation as an artist who will then build up more specialized skills over the next few years. Anyway, in total, I worked for two years as the first in-house designer for Spring Free, and in my spare time, I did everything I could to build up my portfolio and experience as a designer. Needless to say, I got into the program and made one of the biggest decisions of my life. To quit my cozy job, to become a poor student again, and this was in my late 20s, and then to move to a new province and a new city and go to art school. Now here I need to gloss over almost everything that happened in art school to get to the part where I start to drift more toward illustration. I'll just say that going to art school truly was one of the best decisions of my life, but what I learned while there was kind of different from what I expected. At the university level, I found that it was more about learning how to think like a designer, to become better at critical thinking and learning about history and theoretical issues and less about learning nuts and bolts design skills like designing logos and cool posters and stuff like that. But more to my point, so much of what you learn at school happens outside the classroom or outside the planned curriculum. 
So much about being in university is just being where the most opportunities to learn and grow are. My degree program was supposed to be four years, but having previous education and experience, I was able to fast track and do it in just three. In between my second and third years, I had another huge lucky break. I was able to get an internship as a designer at a very cool little studio called Co & Co. This was a sort of collective of a handful of previous grads of my program, including designy illustrators Ray Fenwick and Kate O'Connor. Somehow I'd already discovered their work and I'd become a big fan and I was stoked when I learned that they would be tag team teaching my typography class. I was such a nerd in the class and I think that had something to do with being able to get an internship with them. I was super eager and I really got into the class, probably more than most of the other students. Anyway, while, while learning at Co & Co, I was exposed to the idea of the designer as illustrator. Kate and Ray were both designers and grads of the design program at NASCAD, but they were also illustrating for clients like Urban Outfitters and the New York Times. The very first job they gave me was a series of illustrations for a magazine, including the cover and three interior pages. Again, I want you to think about that. Here I am, a completely unqualified, inexperienced illustrator being given a paid job to illustrate a cover and a lead story in a magazine. I'd never studied illustration before and I'd never illustrated professionally. This is just one of many more opportunities that I would end up getting to build up my professional experience and portfolio before even graduating. But the important thing here is that I was developing my skills as an illustrator even though I was going to school for design. Even though I would spend the first few years after graduation as a designer, my interest and proclivity for illustration was already showing up. Keep in mind that at this time, I had no intention of becoming an illustrator. I just thought that designers also illustrated and that this was just part of my required skill set if I wanted to do the kind of work that I liked. Now, again, I really need to gloss over a whole bunch of my early career, just like I had to kind of gloss over a lot of my art school experience, just so I can get to the part where I consciously decide to be an illustrator proper. That wouldn't happen until about four years after graduating in 2009. By 2013, I was a design director at a small ad agency in Vancouver, but really I was feeling like I wasn't doing the kind of work I loved. I was constantly frustrated with how little creative authority I had at the end of the day. At the time, I really loved studios like Fuzzco, 8 Hour Day, and Matson Creative, who were doing highly creative and illustrative design work. Somehow they had a specific style and they were able to use this style in various ways for all kinds of different projects. It blew my mind that they were able to find clients who let them do such lovely work. Their work was being featured in design annuals and on blogs, and I wanted to be doing work like that too. This is another example of a spark moment for me where I said, I want to do that. So I knew that if I wanted to do that, I needed to go out on my own. I really wanted to have a more direct relationship to my clients and be able to choose clients who would want to work with me in the way that I was most excited about. I felt like so much of the, the reason some of the work that I wanted to do got rejected was there was a, like a breakdown in communication. Like I was on one side of the client relationship and then the clients were over there and then there were people doing most of the selling of my ideas to them. And so I felt like if I could have that more direct conversation with the client and actually set things up from the very beginning in a way that favored the style that I wanted to work in or the, the feeling that I wanted to, to, to bring to the work, then I would be more likely to actually do that kind of work. Anyway, this was in the spring of 2013. And by that summer, I was freelancing as a designer and illustrator. And thankfully, I was able to start building up some illustration projects as I went along. 
Because I already had an illustrative approach to design, which I picked up at Co & Co, people were identifying this and reaching out to me to do illustration specifically, not just design with illustration, but just the illustration part. One of the first things I did when I went solo was create a set of self-promotional business cards and postcards. I illustrated these in what I now call my inky style, and then I had them letterpress printed by my friend Vince at Everlovin Press. The illustration on the postcard was of various illustration and design tools like pens, pencils, a notebook, an ink pot, and a mason jar of water, and just stuff like that. I used the illustration style I had developed first in college working on that first magazine cover with Co & Co. This sort of became my signature look in a lot of the illustration and design work I was doing at the time. Pleased with how they turned out, I submitted the postcards to Communication Arts and much to my surprise and delight, they were awarded a place in their design annual and this led to all kinds of new opportunities which was well, obviously was super awesome. But one of the most significant things about these cards is that I used them to find my first illustration agent. Actually, the most significant thing about these cards is that they became the basis for my first Skillshare class, which is again a whole other story, but it deserves a quick mention here at least. Anyway, I picked out maybe five agencies in the US and the UK that I admired and I wanted to be a part of, and then I hand wrote to each one on the backs of my postcards using India ink and a nib pen. I had a pretty good hit rate too. Two of the five agencies, both in the UK, responded with an offer to be on their roster. I ended up going with Making Pictures in London and I've been with them ever since. That's almost nine years at, this, at the point of this recording. For me, this was the moment when I shifted from designer to full-time illustrator and I've been doing this thing ever since. So that's a sort of medium length story of how I became an illustrator and that takes us up to 2013, which again is nearing on almost 10 years in the past. Between then and now, I have continued to evolve and grow as an illustrator and I, I would say that it wouldn't be until 2018 or so that I really feel like I found my stride as an illustrator, meaning I had a well-established style that I was being pursued for and which I finally actually kind of liked. I had the confidence and consistency in my work that I had always been looking for. Now that doesn't mean that I stopped growing from then, it just represents a time when I think I figured out who I am and what I want as an illustrator as much as I think is possible. So much of what I learned from that point has been turned into my various classes on Skillshare, such as how I found my style, which I teach in the style class, and how I learned to come up with ideas and sketch them out in classes like Drawing Toward Illustration and Sweet Spots. But not until this series of episodes have I attempted to teach on how to really educate yourself or be educated at the beginning part. Even though I didn't officially become an illustrator until 2013, well into my career as a designer, so much of my foundation, the, the skills that made an illustration career possible started back in my foundation year of art school. My hope by telling you a bit of my story is to show you how indirect and meandering the path can be. We think we want to do one thing and we realize as we go that we actually want something else. Or we think we'll be really good at one kind of art but it turns out we're much better at something else. And knowing this, I think we should always have an open mind and be ready to jump into new opportunities when they come, even if they look a bit different from what we planned. As long as we're heading toward a place that's creatively satisfying and which lines up with who we know we are, then that should keep us moving forward. Okay, so let's get on to the final five things you should learn at first as the foundation for the rest of your illustration education. And that brings us first to color theory. There's no way around it, you're going to have to learn some color theory. Even if seeing in color isn't your thing, 
there's still so much you can take away from this subject. Color theory is all about how color works, but not just color, but value or lights and darks as well. In a basic color theory class, you're going to learn about the color wheel, which includes primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. And then from there, you're going to learn about color harmonies. Color harmonies are based on the relationships of colors on the color wheel. For instance, colors that are across from each other on the wheel are called complementary colors. You'll also learn things like value, as in how light or dark a color is, and intensity, or how bright or dull a color is. As mentioned already, color theory is often taught alongside a specific media, especially in painting, but can be learned in isolation as well. In a color theory class, you'll also explore the meanings of different colors in different cultures and why you might choose certain kinds of colors when. Color is a very intimidating subject for many of us, including professional illustrators, but having a bit of color theory under our belts gives us some tools to use it more intelligently. When I was in first year of art college, color theory was taught alongside painting and mixed media techniques, and the most important thing I learned was how to mix colors and build various palettes based on classic color harmonies. In my foundation year studio class, we learned color theory using gouache paint. And strangely, in instead of red, yellow, and blue as our primaries, we used cyan, magenta, and yellow as our primaries and mixed these to produce secondary and tertiary colors. It was surprising for me then to, to, to learn that red was not a primary color here, but actually a secondary color made by combining magenta and yellow. I know that's like a, a, a little detail, but these are the kinds of things you can only start to learn by engaging in a topic in a more deep way. It's little things like this that made me realize that there was so much more to art and design than I first thought. While it's not exactly a college style class, if you want to learn more about how I think about color in my work, please check out my Skillshare class called the One Palette Illustrator. While the focus of the class is illustrating with a very limited color palette, I go pretty deep into how color works and why traditional color theory isn't enough to help us navigate the complexities of choosing color in our work. I'll just say that learning color theory gives you an understanding of the science of color for artists, but it doesn't necessarily make you a genius at using it. I believe that we truly begin to understand how color works for us when learned in concert with a specific physical media type, especially in painting and printmaking. And I think that's just because, you know, color theory really stays too much in the theoretical until it's applied or paired with a more hands-on specific application or skill. So the next thing you should learn, this is the seventh on our list of 10, is graphic design. As someone who started out in design and then moved into illustration, I have the biased opinion that you should definitely learn design as part of your illustration education. But I don't think this opinion is unfounded. As an illustrator, you're going to be playing ball, mostly with designers. So the better you understand design, the better your ball game will be. Designers are the ones who will be giving you the art direction and the ones placing your illustration into their layouts. A design savvy illustrator knows more than just how to make amazing images, but they can also think about how those images they're making will work in the context of whatever they're meant to, to go into, whether that's a magazine, a mural, a website, or an advertisement. Graphic designers also have to learn how to communicate using the elements and principles of design in a more abstract way, which makes us better at composition, regardless of whether it's a typographic layout or a scene with characters and a foreground and a background. We're also trained to be visual communicators and problem solvers in ways that may be less apparent to artists and non-designy illustrators. Illustrators specialize in telling stories and creating scenes in their pictures, and we're encouraged to do this in more personally expressive ways. But on the other hand, designers are trained to think about their audience first and to build whatever they're creating around a brief. 
When you pair the problem-solving mentality of designers with the highly individual and expressive viewpoint of illustrators, you get a very powerful visual communicator on your hands. See if you can find a 100 level design class, perhaps something like intro to graphic design, design for illustrators, or intro to communication design. A class like this would introduce you to design theory, uh, otherwise known as the elements and principles of design, which all artists need to know anyway. You would also learn about typography and layout and possibly a bit of color theory for print design as well. In, in taking my first design classes, I remember realizing how hard it is to actually communicate what you mean in a visual way. Design can be a very frustrating and sometimes rigid feeling subject for more artsy people, but it's exactly the kind of rigor we need to build up in order to make meaningful work and survive in the industry. Any 100 level class you can find in person or online will help accelerate your learning process and give you way more tools to work with as an illustrator in the creative industry later on. Calling back what I said at the beginning of this episode, illustration is design. It's image design. The more we embrace our role as designers, the more powerful we'll be as illustrators. All right, so let's get on to the eighth thing you need to learn. That means there's three more to go, including this one. And this is digital media. We already touched on all the traditional media types, but of course, as an illustrator today, you definitely need to know about digital media as well. Learning digital media in the earlier part of your education really is just about getting introduced to the various types of digital media out there. Particularly, you want to learn the industry standard tools like Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop for the desktop and Procreate or Fresco on the iPad. As you learn these tools, you should also become familiar with the differences between vector and raster illustration tools and why you might choose one over the other for a given project or style. Personally, I recommend that you take introductory courses in all of the aforementioned tools. And again, these are Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop for the desktop and Procreate or Fresco on your iPad. Procreate and Fresco are both more entry-level type apps, so Provided you have an iPad with an Apple Pencil, these would naturally be great for starting off with. Now, a lot of what I've been going through here is more based on what I think you might learn in the first year of the, uh, like an illustration program, but universities are not exactly famous for teaching hands-on technical skills. So while you might have access to tutorials in a degree program, you would have to learn these things on your own anyway. Even though Photoshop and Illustrator were already industry standard skills when I was in art school in the late 2000s, I don't recall ever learning these things in my classes. Fortunately, I was able to learn these on my own and I already had the basics down before even getting into design school by learning them on my own. So in this case, I would actually say where it comes to learning digital illustration tools, whether you're self-taught or being trained in the classroom, your experience is going to be pretty equivalent. So the ninth thing you need to learn on your way to becoming an illustrator is some kind of art history. It could be art history, design history, or if you're lucky enough to find a class on illustration history, learn that. Where it comes to becoming an informed illustrator who can skillfully create images that say what they're supposed to mean to other people, knowing a bit of art history can go a long way. I remember seeing design trends before going to art school and wondering what was behind them. I remember specifically seeing a lot of these swirly flourishes and hand-drawn motifs and hand-drawn lettering at, at, one, at one point, which was maybe in the early 2000s. And it kind of boggled my mind to see these things show up everywhere, kind of all of a sudden. Whether I was out on the street or maybe in an urban outfitters or watching a movie like Napoleon Dynamite, there was this specific aesthetic that for some reason was becoming trendy. Of course, I didn't have to know why they were popular to see their appeal. When things are trendy, we naturally tend to like them ourselves. They, they seem new and they're interesting to us. 
like any beginning designer trying to join in the conversation, I did my best to use these motifs in my own projects. But it also got me curious. Why are certain fonts, colors, and styles popular, and who decides these things anyway? Do the trendy styles mean anything? Is there any rationale behind them? Where do they come from? As creatives, do we just have to kind of keep tabs on what visual motifs are trending and just use them unquestioningly in our art? Or is there a sort of built-in genius that certain creative types have and they're sort of naturally plugged into the designer zeitgeist and this is how they get their ideas and know which trends to glom onto? Well, these can't all be easily answered. What I did learn fairly quickly when going to art school is that so much of what we see today is based on historical precedence. The decorative flourish motifs I was seeing so much of turned out to be based on studies of ornament by historical figures like William Morris, Augustus Pugin, and Owen Jones. The hand-drawn look so popular in design at the time was probably a reaction against the more digitally obsessed look of the 1990s and early 2000s. By taking a little bit of art history, I learned a lot about how history influences the present. I became way more advanced in my artsy language as well, being able to reference different historical periods and how they relate to political and social movements. When you know what certain historical styles came from, you know more of what they're supposed to mean or might mean to others, and that makes us far more powerful as visual communicators. So here's a fun fact. I failed my senior level or OAC art class in high school. When I was in high school, we went up to a 13th year called OAC or Ontario Academic Credit. So that classes at that level were actually equivalent to first year university classes. At that time, I really thought art was just about drawing and painting and self-expression. I wasn't very interested when we had to learn about art history, remembering the names and periods of different art pieces and artists. I thought art was about being talented, not about thinking more deeply about the connection of what we were making or how we were making it and the art movements we were referencing by doing so. But all of this is about learning art history and this was a huge component of my OAC art class. And because I didn't care much for history, I didn't pay attention nor study. And that's why I failed. Of course, at that time, it didn't occur to me whatsoever that art could be a career. So I didn't really take art that seriously anyway. In fact, by the time I graduated high school, I completely rejected the most creative parts of who I am. And that's a huge reason. I ended up in computer engineering. I believed this was a much more respectable career choice. But later, when I started to reconnect with my creative side, art history suddenly became incredibly relevant and interesting to me. I started reading up on art history periods on my own, just through various books. But in my second year in my design program, we had to take a class called the History of Craft and Design and it was one of the most impactful classes in my entire school career. The long and short of it is that I realized how art history is history and how closely tied art movements are to the overarching narratives of how we got to where we are today. It was particularly interesting for me to learn about history through the lens of craft and design, which encompassed the design of so many things we see and use in our lives every day like architecture, interior design, and even things like cutlery and currency. When you learn illustration and design at the college level, you're constantly learning about the history of these things, and this gives you so much more context about the things we take for granted today and how they came into existence. As you learn about illustration, do not underestimate the importance of learning the history of art, design, and illustration. If you can find a class specifically on illustration history, definitely take that as a start. A design history class will be pretty much equivalent since the histories of illustration and design are very intertwined. I'm sure there are some big differences, but I think when you're taking a preliminary design 
history or art history class, anyone is going to be a great introduction. You can always fill in the gaps with a more specialized other kind of history next. So you might be the kind of person who just wants to draw and sure, you can do that and succeed. You don't need to know history to be a good artist. And you can definitely be way too academic, very informed about all the histories, but still not have much skill in actually making illustration yourself. Unfortunately, I've seen this way too much, way more than I, I wish I have. But somewhere in the middle is a highly informed artist, someone who understands the roots of their craft. When we know where we came from, we can better understand where we're going. And most importantly, knowing why things mean what they mean makes us far more powerful in meaning what we say in our art. To get you started, I recommend finding the book Meg's History of Graphic Design by Philip B. Meggs and Alston Purvis, or The History of Illustration by Susan Doyle. While these books do go for between 100 and 200 US dollars, it's a lot cheaper than tuition. As a hack, you might even try looking up the table of contents of one of these books and then doing your own searching on YouTube chapter by chapter. All right, everyone, we're at the 10th and final thing you need to learn on your way to becoming an illustrator at first, and this is writing. In any degree you take, you will no doubt take a writing course of some kind in your first year. Even in my computer engineering program, in our first year, we had to take two semesters of technical writing. This is, as you might expect, pretty technical. It was technical in the sense that we learned the basics of grammar and how to write clearly, but it was also about how to write as a technologist. That means writing lab reports and instructional documents, and I know that sounds super boring and dry, but I really got into this. I love the sense of structure and order we had to follow in our writing, and really thinking about the hierarchy of what we were trying to write. Anyone who's used Google Docs or Word knows about the hierarchy of titles, various levels of headings like H1, H2, and so on, and of course, the body or paragraph. In my first technical writing class, we were trained to organize our thoughts in this hierarchical way. Well, lo and behold, it turns out that in design, this is almost everything that typography is based on. It's not just about choosing fonts or deciding to set our paragraphs flush left or centered. It's about organizing ideas so that others can navigate them without getting lost or without the meaning getting lost. Now, fast forward five years later, and I'm now in my first year of art school. And in our first semester, we have to take a class called writing for the arts. You know, for some reason, the people who design university curricula really want students to learn how to write. Anyway, in writing for the arts, our focus, of course, was less on having perfect grammar, but more about writing about art. My instructor, Mimi, would say things like, writing is thinking, and if you can't describe your idea, you don't have one. So in this class, we really learned the value of being able to formulate thoughts and put them into words. In other words, this was a class that would set us up to be better critical thinkers. Critical thinking is a skill that everybody should have, but especially visual communicators like illustrators, because we have to be able to put into words what we are making. And conversely, we need to be able to put into images what has been expressed so far only in words. Having a perspective is more than just kind of drawing a visualization of what you've read. It's about having a perspective, an opinion, or a viewpoint on what's been read. When we think critically, we think analytically. We gather in various facts and observations and process them from our own perspective. This is huge when it comes to having original ideas in our art, and it's also huge in having ideas that truly relate to our subject. I can't say enough about taking a writing class at some point in your education, especially at the beginning. And I'm talking about a college or university level writing class. Speaking in your native language will of course come naturally, but we don't truly understand the value of our language until we learn how to use it more persuasively and with more precision. 
I have two key takeaways or favorite exercises from my writing for the arts class to share with you. The first was in our free writing exercises. At the beginning of each class, our teacher had us write in our journals for about five minutes, just writing freely without stopping to think about what we were saying. We weren't allowed to judge what we were saying. We just had to just write, 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 keep your hand moving. It was an exercise in just getting our thoughts onto the page. Later, we'd use this as a brainstorming technique to write on a more specific subject, say for an essay, in the same way. After our five minutes was up, we'd go back to underline key ideas that seemed to surface, like what actual thoughts were embedded in our thoughts and we didn't even know it. And in this way, we'd begin to figure out what ideas we actually had on the subject. The other takeaway for me that I want to share with you was just in learning how to brainstorm using star charts or spider charts. This is a simple technique you're probably familiar with where you write a keyword in the middle and then you write related words around it. And from those words, you write more related words. You know, basically we learned how to think with words and we learned ideation and brainstorming techniques. And we're also challenged to have ideas and put them into words and to do so with defensible clarity. Now, writing for me has always come naturally, and I've been a regular writer, journaler, almost all of my life, going all the way back to middle school, as far as I can remember, probably even sooner than that. Even when I was an awful student, I would still write. Writing for me was never an academic, scholarly thing to do. It was a, a means of working things out and of, of expressing myself. Writing has been a tool of survival at some points, and at others, it's been a creative outlet. Even as I do these podcasts, writing is how I come up with what I'm saying. And in fact, I wrote the words I'm reading to you right now. Writing is powerful. I think I've argued that strongly enough for now. When looking for a writing class, look for one that is less about creative writing and more about descriptive and analytical writing. It could be a technical writing class if you're into that sort of thing. Or it could be a business writing class, or one more like my writing for the arts class. Whatever it is, you'll definitely get better with using words, and that will make you a better artist and communicator, and that goes a long way in terms of being a successful illustrator in the long term. So I think we're done. Between the last episode and this one, these are the 10 things you need to learn at the beginning of your illustration education, as far as I can tell. To reiterate, these things are life drawing, structural drawing, traditional media, including painting, mixed media, and printmaking, color theory, graphic design, digital media, illustration history, and writing. These are probably what you'll learn in any college level illustration program. While it's ideal to learn illustration in the classroom, preferably in a three or four year degree, if you're picking these up on your own, you need to take them as seriously as an art school student would have to. When learning illustration, there are no shortcuts. Everyone can learn illustration and you don't have to go to school. It just means you need to be all the more dedicated. You need to be more dedicated to your goal of becoming the illustrator that you want to be. I know you can do it. And I hope these tips really help you get moving forward as fast and as furiously as possible. Now, before I sign off, it's time again for a little thing I call listener mail. This is where I read and respond to some of your comments that come in to me uh, in, in response to previous episodes. Today's letter comes from ZLVS on YouTube, and they write, Dear Mr. Tom Froze, I've just discovered your YouTube channel five hours ago and just watched five videos. I just want to say that I've never learned more about illustration in recent years than I did just now in five hours. Thank you for your generosity to your audience. God bless you and your teaching. So ZVLS, thank you so much for this very kind comment. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me that you spent time with my videos and um, it, it's, it's incredible for me to, to hear things like what you said, that you never learned more about illustration in recent years than you did in, 
you know, the, the five videos that you watched of mine. And yeah, I mean, reading comments like this aloud on my podcast may seem like I'm just self-congratulating, but I just want to tell you, these things mean a lot to me. I treasure them. And I do get comments like this uh, regularly and they are fuel to help me keep going. It's not that I'm looking for compliments, but I do want to know that the content that I'm putting out here is useful and helpful to you. So when I hear things like what I've said makes, you know, it, 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 it's helping you learn a lot about illustration more than other places. I mean, that's pretty incredible. Anyway, please keep your comments coming. I like to respond to them and I'm trying to respond to at least one in every episode at the end like I am doing here. So thank you so much. Keep them coming and please keep listening and, and all that kind of stuff. That's really all for real. My name is Mr. Tom Froze and those were my thoughts on illustration. You can find links to all my things at tomfroze.com, including my Patreon, YouTube channel, and Skillshare classes. Remember to rate, review, like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends, and all those lovely things. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you in the next one.